Our Father who art in heaven, Lord, we're so grateful for the privilege to come and to meet with like-minded people, people who are looking forward to meeting you in peace, to meet you in heaven, uh, our home. That is our goal, O oh Lord. And we pray as we convene this evening to worship you, to fellowship, Lord, that your Holy Spirit will be with us, forgive us of all our sins, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Lord, help that it may not be us who are seen when we speak, but you you that is seen, because we, Lord, we are filthy. Our righteousness are even like filthy rags, but we stand uh, hoping that Jesus will cover us under his blood and help that him will be seen and not us. Thank you for hearing and answering our prayer. May the meeting this evening be a blessing to each and everyone who are here. And Lord, may we have something to share as we depart from this meeting. Thank you for hearing and answering our prayer. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. All right. So I just like to share from my experiences and from um, what God has done for me in my life. Um, and yeah, I just like to share from my heart or uh, from my experiences so that it can be more natural and uh, we can all, you know, um, partake in it. Um, so tonight I'm going to talk about a special topic that as if you're a human being, you're familiar with it. All right. And it's, uh, finding God in adversity. Um, I'm sure many of us here have experienced some ups and downs in our lives. None of our lives are perfect. We all have misfortunes. We all have many, many things that we have to contend with on this pathway to salvation. And especially when you choose the Lord, it gets a little bit rockier, right? And sometimes you tend to feel like the Lord is not with you. Um, I know that I am I am one of those people who have felt that it was so bad that I just want to give up and throw the towel in. All right. And um, I just want to give God thanks that I am able to talk to you and be here this evening. Why? Because I remember when for me, I almost I, 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 I love the feel and the, the taste of the thought of suicide. And um, uh, it had overwhelmed me to the point where I desired it and I wanted it. I even imagined that, you know, one day I could just go and throw myself into a train track and just have it kill me and be over with life because... To me, there was nothing in life for me anymore. And especially um, you guys understand where that's coming from based on our last conversation about my two boys who have autism. All right, so I wanna share about that experience with you this evening and how God delivered me from it. Um, it's, it's a wonderful story, it's a wonderful experience and I'll take you through it. Um, from the time I got married until the time when I went through the experience until the time when God delivered me and brought me into present truth. All right. So um, it's just my life. There's no pretense. Everything that I'm telling you is just what is. <laughs> so let's go back to 2001. All right. So 2001, I was a single girl, happy in university, pursuing women's studies and English. I felt like the world was at my fingertips. And um, I was quite excited about my life and the prospects of it. Um, uh, I struggled with academics at first because I always, you know, I had issues from my childhood growing up that I struggled with, you know, being beaten when I was growing up by my aunt and, you know, just a rough life. You know, it was a rough life. It, it had its good moments, I can't lie. But um, for the most part, I grew up with my aunt. I, my dad and my mom left me at a very early age. And um, I grew up with my aunt. So 
um, what happened was um, the growing up part of my life was rough because my father and my mother, who were not Seventh-day Adventist Christians, in fact, my dad is not a Christian up to today. My mother is a Christian now. She is a pastor of a church, actually, but she is a Sunday worshiper. And so when I, <clears throat> when I was left at a very early age, tender age of three, I, I, I suffered many things. Um, as a child, you can just imagine the feelings of neglect and frustration and wondering why your parents would leave you. I used to always wonder that, why would my mother leave me? I would cry over that at night, you know? And um, I had memories of them, but the memories just seem, some were happy, you know, the feelings of abandonment though were very, very real. And so, and by the way, I don't know if I said good evening to everyone. Good evening, everyone. <laughs> Let me remember my manners. Good evening, everyone. I can see you here. You're all welcome. My name is Sister Nicola Wonsu, and I'm sharing my testimony um, titled um, Finding God in Adversity. All right. Um, I am not reading from a script. I'm speaking from my heart and as the Holy Spirit will give me utterance. So I'm sharing with you and I pray that you'll pray for me as I deliver what the Lord has given me to share with you today. So um, as I was growing up, there were lots of feelings of abandonment and rejection. I felt it. And I was always the outcast child. I just felt like everybody hate me. I used to think everybody is talking about me. If somebody started to laugh, I used to think it was me. And, you know, I carried those things. I carried those things. I bottled up those things. And those things stayed with me and took me into adulthood. And um, the only constant thing, and I'm so grateful, was that when my dad and my mom left me, then my aunt took me up and she started to care for me. And yes, there were some rough moments. Like I said, I had some rough patches with her. But what I can tell you that she did for me that no one can ever take away from me was the fact she brought me to the Adventist church. And um, I grew up in the Adventist church from I was uh, maybe around seven, eight. I was in the Adventist church with my aunt. And, um, you know, I, I imagine that she must have had it rough with me because I had issues. I had abandonment issues, rejection issues. I was rude. I was, in, I just was, <laughs> I mean, I was an impossible child, really. Right. But she really, she bore with me and it was hard for her too, because she also had issues of rejection growing up because my grandmother had left and um, they suffered as children. She and my dad and all the other siblings. So, you know, it's now that I'm an adult that I'm understanding and I'm able to sympathize with her and even, you know, understand the reason she raised me the way she did. It was because she didn't know any better. And she thought she was really doing the best for me. So, but like I said, she gave me the Advent message. She brought me to the church. I had images of my, my, my uncle, her husband, reading a book called Desire of Ages. He would walk around with it and he would always be reading that book. And I found that fascinating. And then as well, um, in the house, they would always play Jim Reeves and all those old time gospel music. Do you think to pray Charlie Pride? I can never forget those things. They were, they're etched in my mind forever because they truly brought me to Jesus in their own way, the way they understood. And I saw Jesus and I met Jesus. And um, I remember one time they invited, I think it was one guy we called Brother Ferrell. And he came to the house and he was doing a cruise, some kind of evangelistic meetings. And in Jamaica, I don't know, maybe Brother um, Zadok <laughs> experiences this back in Kenya. I don't know if you guys experienced this in Norway, but the pastors are very actively involved in the the, the um 
the parishioners or the congregants or the members, yeah, let's say the members, pastors are involved in the in the members' lives. They know where the members live. You know, they would go to their houses, visit them. You would sometimes you just say the pastor comes or the evangelist comes, you know, or the elder comes and look for stuff, look for you and you know, and pray with you and so, so on. Um back then Adventist leaders were in the field doing the work. Right. And it was a real work. I remember that. And it was so powerful that day. Pastor um, Elder Farrell came, Evangelist Farrell. And when he came, he delivered such a powerful message. And that thing touched me. I remember I was under the chair and I was weeping. I was a little kid. I was about maybe 12. I was weeping because I, I felt Jesus. I felt the love of Jesus. And I was weeping because I wanted this. I wanted to be a part of Jesus. I wanted to be with him. I wanted to experience that love that he spoke about in the message. I wanted it to be me. And I'm so, I'm like one thing that everybody knows me for, I'm so passionate. I can't, I can't hide my feelings. I wear them on my shoulder you know and so I just expressed myself I cried and you know eventually I asked to be baptized yeah I think I was around 11 I had I think I was around 11 when I got baptized so it must have been either before or after that pastor Fer evangelist Farrell had come but I know that I got baptized very early it was around 11 because I loved Jesus and I wanted to be a part of Jesus um, but, you know, I, I, as I was growing up, I, I still loved Jesus, but I didn't understand the gospel. I didn't understand, uh, true education because it was never taught to me and neither did I understand true religion. And so I had Jesus on the side. I would still pray. I would still go to Jesus. I would still do the, you know, the rituals. And I would still feel like I love Jesus, but I wasn't completely surrendered to Jesus. And so it was how I continued my life until I got into university. So I was basically a nominal Christian. I would just, you know, go with the flow. You know, and church was very, church, church was very much the way it is now. Um, you know, you go to church, it's like a social gathering, you hang out with your friends, Saturday night, you watch a movie with your friends, you eat popcorn, <laughs> you know, in the morning you go to church, but you know, by the evening, it's either a movie with your friends or you go to the mall or you do, it was never anything spiritual. It was just the friendship part of it, the fellowship, the hanging out. And so that was how I continued in my life in university. You know, so Jesus was there, but he wasn't the central focus of my life. He was there. He was very important part, but not the central focus. And I think a lot of us as Adventists today, we have found ourselves in that position where we don't make Jesus the central focus. He's not the one who tells us about what we should eat. He's not the one who tells us about, or we don't allow him to tell us how we should dress. We don't allow him to be all in all in our lives, right? And that is what I got to understand when I came into present truth that we call that a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. We call that personal. We call that experimental relationship, right? So Jesus becomes Comes our best friend. We keep him close. We hang out with him. We ask him um, if we should speak here or we should keep quiet. We ask him if we should go here or we should not go. We ask him if we should eat that or we should refrain from eating that. You know, we ask him, he completely becomes engulfed in our lives when we start to have a personal relationship with him. But unfortunately, in our churches today, a lot of that is not. Um, what we see amongst even the young people having that close camaraderie with Jesus Christ. And he desires us to have that with him, right? Look at how he was with the disciples. That's what he wants us to have with him. Even the type of relationship that he had with John the Beloved, right? That's what he's calling all of us to have. So let me continue now with that story. So 
Um, by the time I was in university, I was, I think I was in my second year, and then I met a lady at Ottawa West Seventh-day Adventist Church. She is a Nigerian, and uh, she just thought I would make a lovely companion for her brother in Nigeria. And by the way, she told me how she knew him, how he was a lovely man, all of this, all of this, all of this, until I met, went and I met him. And then eventually when I met him, I found out she had never met him before in her entire life. She hadn't known the guy, nothing about him. So I even felt a little bit betrayed in that regard. But uh, I believed that the Lord was leading me um, in the marriage. And so I went for it and um, um, we connected because we were both Adventist, all right? But uh, maybe not at the level that we should have connected, but that's another story, <laughs> right? But uh, the Lord knows best. So um, when we got married, um, we had the first child and then afterwards we, we saw the child was very quiet, very good, well, just a wonderful child, Amarachi. And um, then we went for the second child and then we found out that that boy had autism. That was the second child. So when I found out that he had autism, um, of course, uh, that was a shocker. It was hard. It was it was like the whole of my world just turned upside down. It crumbled. And I don't know, perhaps I could best express it in the way my husband express it. You know, like one day he just came into the house and he just threw himself down on the floor and he just started to wail. And it, he was crying, a big grown man crying. My heart was broken. But I believe that that's a very powerful symbolic imagery of how really the family has taken the, the, the painful revelation that we have, this autistic boy. And then further down in the marriage, we had another boy and he came out autistic again. So it was very painful. It was very painful. And uh, of course, I found, I, 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 I started to depend on God. I started to look up to God for help. And at this time I had come into present truth. I was coming into present truth. I wasn't fully into it yet, but I was coming into it. And um, the Lord was working with me slowly because at this point my heart was broken. So <laughs> I think he really dealt with me very softly. And that's our father, right? He's just a gentle God. He says that um, he's acquainted with our infirmities. He understands our woes, our problems. He understands what we pass through, you know, but he promises us like in Exodus 14, 14, that, you know, I will fight for you. You shall hold your peace. You know, he also promises us, I think one of the scriptures that really gave me comfort was uh, Psalms 27, verse 10, because I would just go back into when my parents abandoned me. And then the Lord reminded me, when your mother and first father forsake you, then I will pick you up, right? And then I just, I just kept that. I kept it. I believed it. I really believe it. I believe it up to now. And it is a very essential, you know, crucial part of my life that the Lord cares about me and that he, pick, he will pick me up even when folks around me abandon me, even when nobody can understand what I'm passing through, the Lord will pick me up. One moment, please. And so let me plug that in. I think my computer will show brighter if I plug it in here. Yes. Can you see me better now? All right. Sorry. Yes. So what happened was um, when we found out the diagnosis of the two boys, I, although I love God so much, <laughs> I started to wonder why me. Yeah. 
And I know that that's not good because I would say, I said that to a very close friend of mine and she said, well, if not you, then who else, <laughs> you know? And um, I thought that was a little bit cold at the time she said it, but then, then I have to just think, why me? Why, why would the Lord choose me for this? You know, why would the Lord allow two beautiful boys to come out and be autistic? Why would he allow these boys to be born in an African culture where boys are so important, especially to my husband and his family? Because in the Igbo culture, the boys are the ones who carry the lineage. They're the ones who carry the, you know, the birthright. They're the ones who carry the family legacy, right? Girls go and marry and go away, but the boys stay and keep the family together. Why would it be like that? But then the Lord started talking to me in little whispers. You know, he would say things to me like, I'm going to use you. I'm going to show you that I still love you. I, he would take me to Songs of Solomon's when I would feel like I don't have any love. I don't have anybody who cares about me. And then he would tell me things like I have dove eyes <laughs> from the Songs of Solomon. I don't know. I, I want to go there. Let me open my Bible. <laughs> like there cannot be a presentation without the Bible being open, right? So let's go to Songs of Solomon. I will just tell you some things. I really took these things very personal to myself because I believe the Lord was speaking directly to me when he would say, let me kiss me, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth for thy love is better than wine because of the savor of thy good ointments. Thy name is as ointment poured forth. Um, therefore do the virgins love um, thee. And then... Um, when tell me, O thou whom my soul loveth, you know, I just, I just felt like those words were coming at me for me, you know, yes, they, they, you know, the Bible is written in such a way that it speaks to each individual's hearts, you know, and it spoke to my heart. It was telling me that God loves me. And he hasn't rejected me because I felt abandoned, especially when I was going around my, I was around my friends who were having normal children. I was in the church. People couldn't really hang out with me because my children were autistic and they were rambunctious and they couldn't keep quiet. You know, when other parents were planning with other parents to go here and do that, I couldn't do it. You know, I had to stay home with my boys. I had to <laughs> become, you know, the fun for them. <laughs> you know, how do I, I just felt like everything was closing down on me. But I felt like the Lord was still with me. And uh, I remember one day, I think I told you guys this the last time we spoke. I remember I was crying on my couch, right? And then I remembered Psalm 6, you know, and Psalm 6 is so powerful because, you know, I could see the vivid imagery, you know, of, of, of the author of that scripture, crying on his couch you know and it said so like if you go into the scripture let's just read it it says in psalms chapter six it says you know um oh lord rebuke me i was reaching out to the lord rebuke me not in thine anger and then it says in six in verse six i am weary with my groaning all the night make i my bed to swim i water my couch with my tears mine eyes is consumed because of grief it walks at all because of all mine enemies. And like I told you guys the last time, I realized that God is not the one to inflict these pains upon me. We live in a world of sin. We are sinners saved by grace. These things are things that can happen to any of us. 
okay? Because we're living in a world of sin, you know? But what God has done is to say, I will carry you through it. I will help you. I will be with you. Do not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that fly by day. I will be with you. He says, the angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that feareth him and he will deliver them, right? So I had to, st I have to believe those words. How do you find God in adversity? You believe his word, you read his word, and you make it personal. Put yourself there, okay? It's it's for me. God is talking to me off of that page. You know, he's telling me, I love you. He's telling me, you are the apple of my eye. He's telling me, I will never leave you nor forsake you. He's telling me, I will fight for you and you shall hold your peace. All right? So how you find God in adversity is to believe his words. That's it. There is no other if or but. You can't romanticize it. It's just to believe his word, take it in, make him make that word real to you. Do you know that sometimes I just sit down and a word will just come to me. And the word did not make sense to me at that moment when I read it. But as I sat down, the Lord said, okay, uh-huh, that word, I'm going to make it real to her now. And he makes it real to me. And I say, aha, it's like an aha moment where the light bulb goes off and you're like, yes, that's what it means. God cares about me. I used to think he didn't care about me because of my abandonment issues, because of my parents leaving me early. And then bad things kept on happening, even in my marriage, where I thought that my marriage was going to be the saving grace of my life, the happiness that I was finally going to have. But instead, it brought me two boys with autism. <laughs> Right? So what do I do? What do I do? Do I allow the spirit of happiness and joy that the Lord has placed within me, do I allow it to go out like a fire when it's poured water on? No, I can't. I have to believe and I have to also encourage. And that's the reason why the Lord sent me to Nigeria and said, go here. Do you know how hard Nigeria is, guys? It's one of the hardest places you could live in the world. It's rough. The terrain is rough. The people are rough. <laughs> well, you know, give and take. But, you know, they have developed that harshness because the environment is so harsh. You know, not because they have an evil heart to do bad, but because it's harsh. They have to protect themselves against fraud, evil and all this corruption around them. So they develop these thick skins, you know, and they don't play around. You know why? Because of the harsh environment. But this is where the Lord called me. But I'm Canadian, Lord. I don't have to go. I could stay in Canada. It's easy there. Greener pastures. Supermarket is just down the road. Food is accessible. You know, housing is okay. I can manage here. But he said, no, this is where I want you to go. And I want you to set up a school for children with autism. Even that alone, God was trepidation for me. I was so fearful. <laughs> I, I delayed on that project for years until he pushed me into it and I had no choice but to just do it, right? So I tell you, my brothers and sisters, if you're listening and you're hearing me, believe God's word. He says that he will protect you. He says he will fight for you. He says you're the apple of his eye. He says he will never leave you nor forsake you. Once you're doing what is right and pleasing in the sight of the Lord, trying to do it, by his grace, through Jesus Christ, He these promises are for you. You don't have to doubt, right? So how do you bear your cross? You don't start to murmur and complain about it. You get up, you take up that cross, and you follow Jesus. And you know what I've learned more than any other thing being in Nigeria is not to look at any human being. I don't see people anymore because I used to remember how that little girl with her, you know, um, anxiety and her rejection and thinking everybody was laughing. If they're laughing, they're laughing against her. That girl, that little girl is no longer there in me because God has given me the strength to show me that it's not the people around you look to Jesus. And even yesterday I went to church and I was 
I went to church in the night and I said, oh, I, Lord, I just want a word. Just give me a word from you. And as soon as I entered the church, it was on the screen, bold, like anything else I needed to see. <laughs> Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face and the things of this earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Amen. And even if I don't get healing for those boys on this earth, I believe with my whole heart that either these boys are going to be healed after the loud cry and then the spirit is poured out. I believe it's either there or in the heavenly kingdom, but I believe. And so because I believe, I don't even want anybody to come near me and shake that belief. That belief is a part of my, my sinew, my fibers. <laughs> they make me up for who I am today. And I want to hold on to that because I believe there is power in that hope, power in that belief, and God will perfect it when he is ready. So I just want to leave with you an encouragement tonight, my brothers and sisters. Put God's word first. There is life in it. There is power in it. There is healing in it. Believe it for yourself. Do not watch what other people have to say. The interpretation or not, not even let's, let, let's me not go there because that's a controversial is, issue. But sometimes God speaks to you specifically about his word for you. And no, and people, if you, people, if you go and say, okay, um, so-and-so, some, so-and-so sister, can you tell me what that means to you? Sometimes God doesn't even want you to go and ask so-and-so sister what that means to them. God has already revealed to you through the Holy Spirit what that means for you. All right, savor upon it, think upon, upon it, meditate upon it, let it become a part of you. All right, the Holy Spirit is more than able to teach you and to guide you into all truth. Sometimes you might take that scripture to somebody and they might make you into a disbeliever, <laughs> you know, yes, you know, so they might snatch that word from you when God had given you that word for you to ponder and savor and allow it to become a part of you. And I believe that when you allow the word to become a part of you, then it can do wonders for you in Jesus name. It can. You just have to believe it. It can change your life. Believe me. And so that's where I want to end for this evening. I hope you were blessed. Thank you so much, sister. Yeah, I'm sure we were all blessed. I was very blessed. And it's, you know, it's, um, you are such a sunshine. It's, uh, <laughs> I'm sure that the Nigerian people, I mean, God is using him, you might evolve for, you know, the or these children and also for the people who are living in that country because you have so different character. God has made you, you know, so, um, yeah, well, bubbly. <laughs> that's the that's one of the criticisms. I'm just so bubbly, but but you know what, to tell you the truth, my sister. The devil almost snatched that bubbly from me because of my situation. I went into a very serious depression and I wanted to commit suicide. I really wanted to because of what I was passing through. But God delivered me from it through his word. He delivered me from it. I was sitting down in church and somebody just came up to me and was saying, oh, Jesus is so lovely. Jesus is so good. And at the time when she was telling me that, a dark cloud was over me telling me to go and kill myself, you know? But when she came, it's like she was a light that God sent to me to penetrate the darkness. And it penetrated and broke up everything. And all she was doing was just speaking the word of God, the word of God into me. That's why I'm telling you, it has power. It has life. It has power. It has life. Well, you were teaching me, you know, I should uh, ask the Lord for more opportunities to do what you are doing now, you know, because, you know, people, they look, everything is fine with me. You know, we are hiding what's going on inside us. Just the Lord knows. But okay. to get the, everyone needs encouragement and we don't know what people are going through. So, uh, yeah. 
I agree with you, my sister. And that's the reason why it's important to share. You know, right. when the Lord has done something for you, brought you through adversity, you know, I, I, I remember how dark it was for me. But if that lady didn't come and start to, to share God's word, where would I be? Where would right. I be? That word, I tell you, the word of God is life. It's very living. It's very real. Very and powerful. Very powerful and transforming. Amen. Right. Yeah, Talia, you came up. You have a comment or question or someone was uh, writing hallelujah here. And I was, uh, <clears throat> have you heard that expression? You know, sometimes black churches are very different from, you know, white churches. Yes. And sometimes when you are in a black, I was belonging to a black church when I went where in America. Come on, preacher, yeah. preach, preach more. <laughs> and that's how I feel when you were preaching. You know, I want to hear more. <laughs> yeah, I will thank you so much for sharing. It's uh, really good. To, we all need to hear the testimonies of how. Uh, uh, the, uh, about the power of uh, of the uh, of the word of God and the, the power of Jesus. So I uh, thank you for sharing. It was so encour uh, it encouraged me. Amen. 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 God is good. Yeah. Oh, let me give you a joke, guys. Let me tell you a joke. And well, it's not a joke. It's a serious story, but it's funny. So during my time of, um, you know, when I came into President Truth, I was, so, I was so excited. I was even more excited than I'm excited now. <laughs> and there was a man, I went to the supermarket and that man was so depressed, so depressed. You could tell that. And I recognized that spirit because remember, I had it. <laughs> So I was like, you know, me with my bubbly talkative self, I was like, hey, sir, how are you doing? You know, it's nice to see you. I started chit-chatting with him. We had our groceries beside each other's. I think I was playing around with him. I was like, what are you going to cook tonight with this uh, stuff you're buying? <laughs> you know, I just started getting into the man's business, you know, and he was probably just like, this lady, can't she keep quiet? You know, but I, I just felt I couldn't keep quiet. I, I had to say something something. And one of the reasons too, why that spirit is in me of just talking to people just to get them out of that is because I remember one time when I was working somewhere and there was a young man who wanted to talk to me and I didn't talk to him. I just, I just didn't. And um, the Monday he committed suicide and that never left me. It never left me, you know? And um, so when I saw that man and how depressed he was, I just started joking around, playing with his groceries, telling him things, joking around with him, talking to him, just making him feel so good. That man, he was so encouraged by just me talking to him. You know, he came and gave me $100 to buy my groceries. <laughs> Gave me a hundred dollars. He said, "You have blessed me so much. Here is a hundred dollars." I was like, in the in the place, I, in the in the store. I think I was just like, "Hallelujah, glory to God!" Was that, went, a, uh, that, uh, that was in Canada. Yes, that was in Canada. Well, I was in Edmonton, Alberta. Yeah. And, you know, I went to, and, you know, he was a white guy too, but me, I'm not afraid to talk to anybody. <laughs> I was just talking to him. I loved him so much. You know, I just felt like I needed to reach out to, this is a soul. You know, that's how I saw it. This is a soul, God's image this is one of god's children you know and so when you when you come into present truth you don't even see color again you don't everybody is brother and sister <laughs> it's true and so you tend to start to see everybody okay that one was made by jesus that one was made by jesus oh we're all brothers and sisters so i just felt like i can talk to him he's my brother <laughs> you know so although he was sad god used me to break into his world and i was able to help him overcome that sadness he left that store happy he was so happy. And I think he even felt more happy giving me that hundred dollars, you know? <laughs> so now, sister, you know what to do. 
if you are uh, lacking money. <laughs> <laughs> oh yes, it was it was lovely. It was so lovely. I went up to the the manager of the Safeway and I was like, look at what this guy did. He gave me a hundred dollars. I was just telling everybody in the store, praise be to God, glory. You know, I wasn't even afraid. And that that was just the Lord. You know, you have your problems, but your problems are nothing when you meet somebody else who have their own problems and you want to help them solve it. You know, I read something today that was so powerful. Let me see if I can find it. I'll share it with you right now. It was just so, so powerful. Um, it says that, um, and this is taken from, okay, let's see. This is taken from Christ Object Lessons, page 139. Paragraph two, it says, not for himself, but for others, he lived and thought and prayed. Isn't Amen. that powerful? And yes. that's what God is calling us to do, to not live for ourselves, but for others. And truly, I can tell you that my life is for others. I truly, I, I and I want God to bring me to that place where self can die entirely, that only other people, that service to mankind becomes my priority 100%. Amen. That's, that's my desire. Amen. I think that's all over prayer. It should be all over wish and prayer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. I should do this you a little closer than I could give you a good hug. <laughs> I know. Me too. So um, yeah, so um, hopefully we can see you soon again. I know it's not that easy for you because you have you know the children and the teaching and so on. But uh, please let me know because it's um, so. What other are you? You are lecturing too, right? Yes, I lecture. I lecture. Well, I lecture for a high school. Mm -hmm. um, well, I teach for a high school in uh, in the UK and in the US. It's um, a present truth remnant preparatory school, a present truth school. So we teach from the Bible and the spirit of prophecy, the academic work. So I teach mm -hmm. English and communications and um, some other history, geography, prophecy and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah, so you have uh, have a class here too. Say the thing. Yes. I, oh, oh, praise <laughs> God. <laughs> and I could I could share with you some lovely things out of the sunlight curriculum, because the Lord has really unschooled me with that curriculum. You know, teaching me how to see Jesus in everything that is in the academic world you know like so even when i'm teaching subject verb agreement for example you know in a simple sentence like john loves to play you know so the subject has to agree with the verb the singular subject with the singular verb and so on um god brought me to amos 3 verse 3 can two walk together lest they be agreed right so then you see the scripture coming out in the in in the actual academic work which is pretty amazing right and then the other kind of spiritual lessons that you can get from that so powerful yeah, yeah. when we have the holy spirit we can see you know lectures in everything we are doing actually spiritual lessons exactly exactly amen and hallelujah amen <laughs> yeah. So maybe Brother Sadok, we have you with her us here. Maybe you would like to have the closing prayer today. Yeah, sure. Mm. We can pray. Let's pray. Our Father and our God. We are so thankful for the opportunity we have had to hear the words of grace from the lips of our sister Nicola, spoken to us by you through her as an instrument in your hands. We are so thankful that we have been encouraged to see our problems, Lord, in the mirror of your word as little problems that you are using to help us better 
meet you and know you. And we are thankful, Lord, that we can meet you through these problems. Thank you, Lord, for the experience of our sister. Whatever we are going through and whatever your people will listen to such testimonies are going through, we pray that, Lord, we may see them as opportunities to meet you and to know you better. Thank you for this group and thank you for this ministry. Continue to bless every single one of us, giving health and protection and peace and bringing us into a closer and nearer walk with thee. For this is our humble and most sincere prayer in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.